Welcome back to our discussion of emotions, aggression, and stress. We're going to talk a little bit more about emotions and um, correlates in the brain, and then we're going to get in just briefly into aggression and stress. So we'll talk about the parts of the brain that seem to be particularly evolved in emotion in the next sl coming slides. However, I wanted to show you this because it really should be noted that emotions activate many different parts of the brain. So these images show brain activation during sadness, happiness, anger, and fear. And you can see that there are many brain regions involved. Also, there's a lot of overlap. The same brain region may participate in different emotions, which kind of makes sense given that um, activation, you know, a lot of the physiological activation is very similar between different emotions. But with that, you know, while we'll talk about certain areas of the brain that are important for emotion, it's not to say that that area is solely responsible for the emotion. Um, or that we really even fully understand what brain areas are related to each emotion. So Kluver-Busey syndrome is characterized by emotional changes such as a reduction of fear and anxiety after bilateral amygdala damage. And this makes some sense. As you probably remember, uh, fear responses are often associated with the amygdala. Um, so with this, it's not surprising that the amygdala, um, which is located in the temporal lobe, is a key structure in mediating fear. Also remember, we talked about back with, um, talked about theories with autism, um, that individuals who have autism also seem to have um, um, activation of the amygdala when someone when you see a human face. So again, it may suggest that individuals with autism struggle with um, eye contact, for instance, because they have feelings of fear due to this um, amygdala activation. So this again just highlights that amygdala is really important, we believe, for um, fear, feelings of fear. Neural circuitry has also been studied for some other emotions. So disgust isolates, or activates rather, the insula, which is a very small part here, and also the um, putamen, which is here. So those are, seem to be especially activated in disgust, and laughter activates the prefrontal cortex. So you don't have to know the specifics of this. I'm not asking you to memorize this, but again, what I want to show you is um, what different brain areas are involved in emotion and that you can have several emotions present for one area. So for instance, we have um, the paradactyl gray area here that's responsible for all of these emotions whereas the dorsomedial thalamus is responsible for, or at least partially, it's at least correlated, how about that, with both panic and happiness. So again, these emotions don't have to agree. Um, it's just where we see activation when someone reports that they are experiencing these emotions that gives us a suggestion of what may be happening in the brain with emotion. Now the right hemisphere seems to be especially important for emotional processing and it is in charge of discerning other people's emotions. So because of this, the left side of the face, which is controlled by the right hemisphere, is more expressive than the right side of the face. So what they did here is they cut this image in half and flipped half of it to make a picture of this boy with just the right side or just the left side of um, his face. And what you can see is comparing the right side to the left side, you see more emotion on the left side of the face. It's because this, um, because of the impact of the right hemisphere. So the two hemispheres differ also in emotional tone. So 
the right hemisphere is better at identifying the emotional tone and the left hemisphere is better at interpreting the meaning of the emotional tone so the right hemisphere kind of knows what the emotion is the left hemisphere knows more of why it is um, also, you see differences with damage. Uh, damage to the left hemisphere produces depressive symptoms, whereas patients who have damage to the right hemisphere are usually very cheerful. So that also gives us an idea of some um, differences in the brain in regard to emotion. Um, the right visual field is also more accurate and faster at identifying emotions than the left visual field. So just a couple more you know, differences as far as brain processing of emotion. So now moving on to aggression. Um, inner male aggression is just aggression that we see between males. And in non-human animals, um, androgens appear to increase aggression, um, but it's not as clear in humans. So here you have um, castrated males where you can see quite a strong effect of administering testosterone um, to either before it was introduced or after as far as aggression. So here in these um, non-human animals, um, the aggression does seem to be tied with um, androgens. However, we don't see this in humans. Um, so times when testosterone increases, such as teenage years, we don't really see a marked increase in aggression. So it's not, the, the relationship isn't one-to-one. -one. It's not clear, it's not as clear in humans. There's also a negative correlation between serotonin and aggression. So mice who lack serotonin are often hyper-aggressive. And low serotonin levels are found in humans in alcohol-induced violence, um, excessive military violence, and in children with poor impulse control. So this is important because it actually relates to another um, aspect of psychopathology, which is there's a theory, overall you, you likely know that men do not experience um, depression as often as women, or at least not by DSM criteria. And one thought is that there may be a masculine depression uh, where men exhibit depression differently than women, and that the um, criterion we have are more you know, feminine depression oriented, whereas if they're a little different, it may catch the men who are depressed, but don't show the typical signs, you know, like, um, you know, sadness, trying things like that, they may show their depression in a different way. And this kind of relates with that. So again, with low levels of serotonin being associated with aggression, one part of the um, masculine depression hypothesis is that men may be more aggressive um, when they're depressed. So it kind of fits in with that since we'd also assume that depression would be associated with lower levels of serotonin, which we'll get into in the um, later lectures, so in the lectures uh, following this when we get into psychopathology. So Cellier's general adaptation um, syndrome model, which aims to show the connection between stress and illness, says that when we have a stressor, um, the first response to stress is alarm, and it's followed by an adaptation to that stress that hopefully restores balance. Um, when balance is not restored, one can get to an exhaustion phase, which is caused by prolonged or frequent repeated stress that is characterized by increased risk of disease. So this helps explain why um, stress may be associated with more diseases. If you cannot adapt to it or cannot stop the stress, if you have that prolonged exposure, you eventually have this exhaustion re uh, reaction to the stressor. And also, um, stress, of course, impacts the immune system, we know. So stress hormones such as cortisol actually suppress the immune system, which in the long term results in impaired immune system function and also illness. 
So while stress, um, while the stress hormones can act as a short-term defense mechanism, long-term it causes significant problems such as psychological distress, depression and grief, and also the decreases in immune functioning.